so good to see you. Happy Thanksgiving. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? You look like you gained a little weight. No, you look, you look good. I'm just kidding. Thanks so much for being here today. Really, really honored that you'll be here with us. Uh, certainly welcome everyone in the chapel behind us, everyone at our Chaska campus, and a huge hello to uh, everyone watching online today. Well, we are in Judges chapter 16 today. If you want to go ahead and uh, make your way there uh, on your device, in your Bible, Judges chapter 16. Because today we're going to wrap up our little kind of series within our series on Israel's last judge, a man by the name of Samson. So we kind of picked up his story starting in Judges 13, then 14, 15, and today we kind of wrap it up in Judges 16. And as I was thinking about Samson's story, it's, it's, kind, of like a, uh, it's kind of like a fairy tale in reverse, right? It's, it's, it starts on a high note but gets progressively worse kind of chapter by chapter. And, and, and today is, is no different. Samson just kind of assumed and presumed upon God. He assumed that his, uh, his gifts, that his looks, that his strengths, that his abilities were kind of his by right and not by God's grace and that their purpose was, was just to make him happy. And, and rather than like coming to his senses where it's kind of like, oh, I had the aha moment, he never does have that, that moment. He just continues down this pathway of destruction. And chapter 16, tragically, sadly, embarrassingly, picks up with him visiting a prostitute in Gaza, the headquarters for the Philistines. Now, now Gaza was like the southernmost city among the Philistines. It was about uh, 45 miles or so away from Samson's home. And, and Samson, Samson had no business being there, obviously, with a prostitute, and certainly no business being there among his avowed enemies. So, so if you'll remember, kind of picking up from chapter 13, over the last, I would say, 20 years or so, two decades or so, Samson had become like public enemy number one for the Philistines. They despised him. He was a thorn in their flesh. And they, they wanted to get back at him badly. And so while in Gaza, his enemies kind of get a bead on where he's located and kind of what he's doing. And so they decide they're going to take action. And for all practical purposes, he was, he was trapped. And finally, they, they thought the odds and the gods were, were with them. And so they surrounded the place where he was, where he was in Gaza with the prostitutes, surrounded that place, and planned on killing him at, at dawn. However, Samson had a different timetable. He only stayed there until midnight, and then he slipped out undetected to the city gate. So let's pick up there in verse 3. Here's what it says. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and he pulled them up. So this is an amazing feat of strength. He pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. So he was essentially, here in verse 3, he was essentially kind of sending the people of Philistine, his enemies, sending them a message that he was untouchable. Like there's nothing you can do to capture me, to harm me, to get to me. I'm in charge of me from beginning to end. Now, now the rest of chapter 16, verses 4 through 31, kind of shows us what, what the agony of defeat looks like, if you will, in high def clarity. Beginning there in verse 4, it says this. After this, and, and you almost have to laugh at this. After this, he loved the woman. You're like, really? Is it about another woman? Like his whole storyline is about him crashing and burning with a woman. After this, he loved the woman. You're like, yeah, sure you did. After this, he loved the woman in the valley of Sarek, whose name was, you know, the, her name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, seduce him, seduce him, and see where his great strength lies. And by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will give you, each give you, 1,100 pieces of silver. You can become a rich woman if you'll give us this intel. 
And so Delilah said to Samson, turn on the charm. Please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. Now, just a quick word here. When, uh, when your girlfriend is asking for your PIN number on the first date, she's probably not that into you. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you miss this red flag? It's a bit of a red flag, don't you think? And so on three separate occasions, Samson just toys around with Delilah's request. On one occasion, he says, well, here's the secret to my strength. Tie me up with seven fresh robes, and I'll be weak. Uh, on another occasion, he says, tie me up with, with new robes that haven't been used, and, and then I'll be weak. Uh, on a third occasion, he says, weave the seven locks uh, of my head and fasten it with a pen, then I'll be weak. In reality, none of the aforementioned were secrets behind his strength. And on each occasion, Samson defeated even more Philistines. Well, obviously, this hurt Delilah's feelings and exasperated her. Look at what she says in verse 15. And she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times, and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And then she turns up the pressure. Emotional blackmail ensues. Look in verse 16. And when she pressed him hard with her words, day after day, and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. You, you know that proverb, a, a nagging wife is like a dripping faucet? That's here, right? Is this, this incessant beat down. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. And then verse 17, and he told her, told her all his heart, all his heart. And he said, a razor has never come upon my head. For I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Verse 18, she shrewd, she sees this. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and she called the lords of the Philistines, saying, come up again. This is for real this time. For he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her, and they brought the money in their hands, Paid her off, verse 19. Then she made him sleep on her knees, so he falls asleep on her lap. Calls in the barber. The barber comes in, shaves off the seven locks of his head. And then she began to torment him, like to awaken him, and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. Like she's trying to help him. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as, as other times and shake myself free. He's done this over and over and over again. Here they are again. Boom, I'm free. Go incredible hulk on these guys, right? No one can ever touch the man. But he did not know. Look what it says. He did not know that the Lord had left him. And so she completely, completely set him up. In verse 21, the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. And then I want you to notice there's a little verse, verse 22, that's not just a, a verse about how his hair is doing, how he looks now. Look what it says. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. And so you get a glimpse that even in prison, God had not abandoned Samson, because God does not leave us even when we turn our backs on him. Now, the city leaders of the Philistines held a celebration to praise, to praise their god, their god, Dagon. In their view, Dagon had finally vindicated himself. And so the only thing that would make the celebration better was a collective gloating, highlighting the superiority of Dagon over Yahweh, while also utterly humiliating Samson publicly. And so they called Samson out of the prison, demanded he entertain them, perform for them, in the sense that his blindness was their source of perverse entertainment. 
And, and so when Samson emerges from kind of the cavern, Samson discovered where he was, he asked the attendant to position his hands on the pillars that supported the temple so he could actually lean against them. Now here's what we know. We know that the balcony roof of the temple held roughly 3,000 people or so. And so it's likely that anywhere between five and 10,000 people, including the leaders and rulers of the Philistines, were enjoying the view of what Samson could not see. Samson, however, did not plan to be their entertainer. He planned to be their executioner. And so he prayed to the Lord one last time, God, remember me, God, remember me. If you would just one more time strengthen me. And God answered Samson's prayer, including the plea to let him die with the Philistines. And so after placing his hands on the two central pillars, he pushed with all his might, and the temple collapsed on top of the rulers of the Philistines and all the people who were there. We actually have some drone footage, maybe what it looked like. Here we go, not historical, but it gives you a picture of the moment, right? And everything comes crashing down. Pick up in verse 30, and Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. This was his prayer to God. Then he bowed with all the strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. And so the dead, check this out, so the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. One commentator said, ever the entertainer, Samson literally brings the house down. No pun intended, ha, 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 ha. This grisly episode is followed by a super touching moment. And so even though in his life, Samson had turned other people away for various reasons, notice that his own people, his own people in his death did not turn away from him. Look at verse 31. Then his brothers and all his family came down and they took him and they brought him up and they buried him between Zorah and Eshtal in the tomb of Manoah, his father. And then you almost forget because there's so much drama surrounding his life, you almost forget that he was a judge. He's Israel's last judge. And then it kind of gives you kind of the, the rundown here that he, that he judged Israel for, for two decades, for, for 20 years. Now, now, Scripture offers kind of three epilogues to the story of Samson, kind of three markers along the way. Uh, number one, it says that he killed many more Philistines when he died than while he lived. Number two, it says that he led Israel for 20 years, and you don't hear a lot about what happened in the nation of Israel because there was just so much chaos and drama in his own life. And so the last statement is found in Hebrews, guess where? Chapter 11, verses 32 to 34. So he makes it in the Hall of Fame, the Faith Hall of Fame. So look at what it says. Hebrews 11:32 32 says, and what more shall I say, for time would fail uh, me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. And then look at the summary statement here. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness. That's a key. Were made strong out of weakness became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. And so, and so in a significant way, Hebrews chapter 11 is, is like a hall of fame of faith as well as a hall of salvage, if you will. Like every person in Hebrews chapter 11 had times of significant failure. And yet God being God decided to use flawed people powerfully. How many of you are glad to hear that? Like God still uses flawed people powerfully to accomplish his will and his purposes. And so even so, Samson at the end of his life was made strong by God in his weakness. It's very Pauline, isn't it? Made strong by God in his weakness. And God used his weakness to highlight God's own strength. So here's a great lesson, right? In life, it's never about how strong you are. It's not about how strong you are, but how strong he is in you. Amen? That's what we say, how strong God is in and through you. 
And so we want to be good Bible, right, Bible students today. So we're going to ask ourselves the question, what then is God saying to us today? How do we apply this to our lives? Well, the first thing I think God is saying to us today that we learn from Judges 16 is this. Sin is a killer. Sin is an absolute killer. I actually found a really old school outline on, on Judges chapter 16 that I think is just fantastic. The outline is this, sin binds, sin blinds, sin grinds. That'll preach, by the way, right? That's what sin does. It binds you, it blinds you, and it grinds you, like it grinds you up. So, so think about it, right? Sin kept Samson like in bondage to his flesh. He was just a slave to his, to his flesh. Sin actually blinded Samson spiritually and eventually physically too. Sin ultimately caused his life to come to a grinding halt. He literally ground at the mill in prison. One person said this, sin gets its power. Like how does sin have such power over us? Sin gets its power by persuading me to believe that I will be happy if I follow it. And so listen, the power of all temptation to sin is the prospect that it will make me happier. It's the biggest lie on the face of the planet. It's why we need to remind ourselves over and over and over again that sin does not make us healthier. It does not make us happier. It binds us. It blinds us. It grinds us up, meaning it harms us. It hurts us. It hampers us. It hinders us. And it ultimately destroys us. And you look at Samson's life, and he, and he never one time took sin seriously. He just never did. One of the ways that you know you're maturing in your faith, that you're really heading in the right direction with your Christianity, is that you will have an ever-increasing seriousness over sin in your life. You won't discard it, you won't rationalize it, you won't belittle it, you won't trivialize it, you won't excuse it. You'll start to take it really, really seriously because you understand how seriously God's word takes it. Paul told us the wages of sin is, is death. And that's true today too. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So take sin seriously. It'll bind you, it'll blind you, it'll grind you. It will eventually rob you of your future, rob you of, of your life. Uh, a second thing I think God is saying to us today is this, from Judges 16, is that, that choosing, choosing a godly spouse is important. Like choosing a godly spouse is important. So Samson's decision-making skills, uh, his decision-making process regarding women was shallow and superficial and shaky and certainly fleshly. It had no basis in godliness or character or integrity. So, so women... Let's just say that you're, that you're on the hunt and you are, you are saying, God, I want you to lead me to, to the man of my dreams. Let me give you a checklist, okay, just to run through. It's my checklist from the Bible and from me, okay? Uh, number one, make sure he loves Jesus, and make sure he loves Jesus, not just to impress you. Make sure he was loving Jesus before he met you. You know what I'm saying? A lot of guys get really, really spiritual. Yeah, baby, anything you want, girl. Yeah, yeah, I love Jesus too. Oh, you do. You do. So make sure he loves Jesus, like on his own. Not because of you, but on his own. Uh, number two, make sure he attends church. Like, make sure worship is an important part of his life. Uh, number three, make sure he has a job. Make sure he has insurance. Make sure he has his own car. 
I'll make sure he's like not on his, not on his cell phone playing with his mom. Uh, make sure he has character and integrity. Make sure he has a backbone. Make sure he respects you, cares for you, loves you, and would give his life for you. That's a good checklist to start with, okay? And if I were gonna like pull one out of that list and highlight it, I would say this. Make sure he has insurance. Cause gonna, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, gonna come, it's gonna become really, really important. You know what I'm saying? Cause you're gonna finally get off your parents' insurance. Uh, okay, y- y'all with me, young women? So don't, don't settle. Don't settle, all right? And then uh, for you guys looking for a wife, listen to this. Listen to the words of the mother of a king. Amazing. The words of King Lemuel, Proverbs 31, an oracle, check this out, an oracle that his mother taught him. What are you doing, my son? Did you love that? What are you doing, my son? And I love this. What are you doing, son of my womb? So Sherry, so I have a a son, Drake, who's 20 now. Sherry, that was a a line she always used. Hello, son of my womb. It creeped him out. It was just creepy. It's a creepy thing to say. Hello, son of my womb. (laughs) What are you doing, son of my vows? Then look at verse 3. Look at how great this wisdom is. Do not give your strength to women. Your ways to those who destroy kings. An excellent wife who can find. She's far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. And he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and she works with willing hands. So find a good farm girl. It's kind of what he's saying there, right? Verse 14. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it's yet night, provides food for her household. She's not lazy. She works really hard, portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. Uh, She's industrious. She's judicious. Uh, Verse 17, she dresses herself with strength. She knows how to look good in the right ways, not just on the outside, but on the inside. She makes her arms strong. Uh, Verse 18, she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. There's nothing lazy about this woman at all. She puts her hands to the distaff and her, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor. She doesn't just take care of her family. She cares about the poor. She reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household. She's Minnesotan. She's got to, you got to deal with the snow. It's cold. For all her household are clothed in scarlet. She's not worried about the future. Why? Because she's She's prepared. She's prepared. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and and, and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. She makes him better than he is. And all God's men said what? Yeah, yes. Wives always make us better than we are if we have the right wife who's really doing it the right way. When he sits among the elders of the land, verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. The teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Who wouldn't want to be with this woman, right? She looks well to the ways of her household, does not eat the bread of idleness. Look at how she impacts her family. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful. And beauty is vain. It's fleeting. Here today and gone tomorrow. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. That's a pretty comprehensive list, isn't it? Amen. That's a beautiful, beautiful list. So I'm going to say this to you. Choosing a spouse is the second most important decision that you will ever make. So use godly wisdom. Like, don't get worn down in this. Be patient. Be persevering. Don't lower your standards. I think sometimes men and women is kind of like, oh, we get in a rush. We get in a rush. We get in a rush. We get desperate. We lower our standards. And then all of a sudden the criteria becomes, do they have a pulse? (laughs) Yeah, the dude's breathing, but he isn't good for you. I'm not going to help you. And so that's where you, you, you trust in God. This is such an important decision. 
all of Samson's life was marked by this train wreck uh, in the series of relationships that he had. Number three, a third thing I think God is saying to us today is this, is that the world needs someone stronger than Samson. Do you, do you remember in, in, um, in Luke chapter 24, on the road to Emmaus, that Jesus, you remember this? Jesus explained to the disciples how everything in the Old Testament was actually all about him. And, and most people have a hard time reading the Old Testament like that. And I, I mean, I had a lot of people when, when, when they found out we were going to do like a 20-week series through the book of Judges kind of go on, oh, I'll see you in 20 weeks. Like, oh, no, not Judges. And so they trudge through a book of Judges and kind of wonder like, what does any of this mess have to do with like my life? What does any of this mess have to do with, with Jesus? Well, there are, there are hints everywhere if we know how to read them. So here's how you think about the Old Testament. All the stories, all the narratives in the Old Testament provide the shadow for which Jesus is the substance or the reality. So what they begin, Jesus finishes or completes. So for example, Samson was arrogant and weak. Jesus was humble and meek. Samson recklessly broke God's laws. We know that Jesus perfectly fulfilled all of God's laws. Samson was sinful in thought and deed and word and action. Jesus never sinned. Samson caved to temptation over and over and over again. Jesus never yielded to temptation. Samson took his own life. Jesus gave up his own life. One commentator said this, Admiring Samson for his strength might impress us, but it can never truly change us. Because what we need the most isn't, now will you hear me? It isn't a strong role model. What we need is a weak and broken Savior. Someone who would give us his strength and save us from ourselves and our sin. And so the irony of Samson the irony of Samson was that he was strong on the outside, but weak on the inside. And that's every single one of us in this place. We kind of give off, off this persona like we're really, really together. And we're really, really strong on the outside, but we are pitifully weak on the inside. And so when you see and believe what Jesus did for you that he who was strong became weak for you, that he who was rich became poor for you, that the righteous one became sin for you, that life himself underwent death for you, it's then and only then that you will live and receive the strength to live a life that Samson could not live. And so listen, the point of, of reading scripture, whether it be Judges or Jonah or John, the point of reading scripture and preaching sermons is the worship of Jesus. It's not about learning new facts. It's not about like having application points. It is about worshiping and loving more fully and wholeheartedly the person of Jesus Christ. It's about esteeming him and honoring him in all of our lives. And so there comes a time when the pen goes down and the eyes go up and you quit saying, oh God, oh God, look at how much I've done for you. And you say, oh God, look at what you have done for me through your son, Jesus. And so no one, please hear me, no one's telling you to be strong today. No one's telling you to be strong today. No one's telling you to figure out your own problems today. No one's telling you to grind your way through your pain and disappointment today. No one's telling you, hey, hey, do it yourself today. You can do it. No one's telling you that at all. Oh, no. What we see today is this, is that God's power is perfected through your weakness and that God uses our 
weakness. Hear this. God uses our weakness so we'll see his strength and trust in Jesus and not ourselves. Amen? Amen and amen and amen. And so today, listen. Take, like, take sin seriously. Like some of you, you are on a pathway of destruction and you have bought like hook, line, and sinker into this lie that sin's gonna make me happier. It's just gonna make me happier. I promise you, I promise you, it will not make you healthier or happier. It won't. And so you can ask Jesus. Here's the amazing thing about the gospel. This is amazing. You can actually ask Jesus Jesus, to forgive all of your sin right now. And you know what he'll do? When you place faith and trust in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Now hear this, unbelievable. Jesus will forgive all of your past sins, all of your present sin, and all of your future sin too. So are you saying to me, that I can be completely and wholly and fully, totally forgiven, it's exactly what I'm saying to you. He will forgive all of your sins when you place faith and trust in him. So you can do that, like you can do that like like right now. Uh, Secondly, I would say this. Some of you are in relationships that I think that you really need to evaluate today. I think you really need to assess today. Is is this the person? Is this the man? Is this the woman that God has called me to be with, to to do ministry with? Is is this the person? Am I settling? Am I lowering my standards? I think you really have to think deeply about that today. Seek godly counsel from friends and family around you. Listen to what your mom has to say. Listen to what your dad has to say. And then finally, I think the message is this. Embrace your weakness. Embrace your weakness. Don't be ashamed of your weakness. Embrace your weakness because it allows Christ to be strong in you. And Christ strong in you is a testimony to the world. Amen? So God, we thank you for your word. I thank you for how incredible it is. And I pray today that you would use it to transform our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.